Grace and peace to you today from God, our creator, and Jesus, our wisdom. Amen. Today, I'm going to share with you the story about a friend of mine named Meg. Partway through seminary, Meg disappeared without ever leaving. It happened gradually at first. She was just so tired all of the time. Then she stopped hanging out, stopped meeting people for lunch. She barely made it to class, and it seemed like she had sort of just checked out. It all happened so quietly that people hardly realized when she disappeared. I mean, she was still physically there, going to class and walking through the halls. But without quite realizing how it had happened, she had become this shell of who she was. And she was kind of gone. Years later, she told me that it was like her head was in a thick gray cloud. Then there came a day when she physically couldn't get out of bed. I don't think that years ago I had a nuanced understanding of the word depression. I mean, we all feel blue sometimes, sometimes really blue and even eh, depressed. Years ago, I felt blue when my roommate finished the Cheetos. I felt blue when Frank Thomas left the White Sox. I felt blue or depressed when my dad sold our childhood home and downsized. I don't know that I understood then that being chemically depressed or anxious could be soul-sucking and terrible. Meg later told me <clears throat> that although she suspected at the time that she might have been eh, a little depressed, her parents had put this idea in her head that depression was made up and medications weren't helpful. There in her little apartment, Meg's life continued to spiral and unravel until she was at risk for failing her classes. When I realized way back in June that the Bible story for this Sunday, the final story in our summer series Unraveled, was the story about this man from Garrison who was healed. I thought of depression and my friend Meg and I contacted her a while ago and she gave me permission to use her story today. Now, I don't know if Meg's depression <clears throat> just made her feel flat or hollow, or if it took her to a place where she heard voices like that man from Garrison in today's Bible reading. You know, those self-critical voices that told her that she would never be good enough, that she was unlovable, that she was nothing more than a burden to people, that she was as one depressed person told me years ago, a waste of space. That man from Garrison heard a legion of voices that led him to want to harm himself. Now the church has had a hard time over the years talking about things like depression or anxiety. And the church, frankly, has said some really dumb things about depression. Jonathan Anger writes about how in the midst of a depression, the church said things to him like, oh, now all you need to get over this is Jesus. Or look, people who know God don't walk around just feeling sorry for themselves like you do. Or when you feel bad, just spend some time with God and your troubles will just melt away. From that perspective, in today's Bible story, it seems like all this anguished man needs is a couple of minutes with Jesus and he will be fixed, right? If God is the secret sauce that we pour on our problems to fix them, then it sure seems like if you're depressed, you must be failing at the whole God thing. It's like, buck up believer, God will lead you through. Just, just believe it. The truth is that sometimes God's love can't crack through the chemical imbalances in our brain. The truth is that sometimes God's love can't crack through those imbalances that cause depression and mental illness. 
The truth is that I can't love someone fiercely enough or support someone fully enough to pull them with my love out of a depression. Love can't break through the cloudy emptiness or anguish or depression or anxiety. But pharmaceuticals can. Therapy can. Back to my friend Meg. Eventually, at risk for failing out of school, Meg connected with a, with a school administrator who hooked her up with a therapist. When we talked, Meg, who's now a pastor, told me, sometimes no matter how hard you try, your brain just needs a little help. You wouldn't walk off a broken leg. And in the same way, you wouldn't walk off a deep depressive episode. At first, Meg started seeing a therapist a couple times a week who helped her become open to the idea of medication. She was prescribed a couple different medications, first one, and then she tried another one. And then on the third medication that she tried, it had almost an unbelievable effect on her. And within two weeks, she was able to get out of bed and get dressed. She was able to take care of herself and get back to class. She said that the transformation was night and day. I know that's not the case for everybody who experiences depression, but it happened to be the case for Meg. Statistics show that around 40 million U.S. Americans experience some sort of anxiety disorder or depression, and that both COVID-19 and the uprising around police brutality and reckoning with our racist past and present are accelerating feelings of anxiety and depression and despair. I don't think that's news to any of us. Now, I don't know exactly what it was that healed that man from Gerasene when he and Jesus met. And mark my words, Jesus did heal him. But let's not kid ourselves as the church into thinking that all you need is a little Jesus love and some pats on the back from a loving person to break through the hell that can be depression. How Jesus, Son of God, moved and worked in this world is beyond our understanding and our ability to totally imitate. Healing this kind of mental anguish, like Jesus did, is not in our power. I do know that we have God-given wisdom that guides us as we develop medications and treatments that cut through the legion of voices or the gray cloud that we might live in. To look at this Bible story as a simplistic tale where Jesus swoops in and fixes everything with a little magic Jesus sauce is a simplistic way of reading our Bible that assumes that there is no connection between the way that God moves in the world and modern science. And that is baloney. I know of a pastor who says that a little pill of Wellbutrin that he takes every day is almost like a life-giving sacrament to him. What I see here is that Jesus isn't afraid of this suffering man's pain. I mean, the people of Gerasene had locked this guy up away on a hill and down in central Gerasene, it seemed like life was just hunky-dory because there was that guy experiencing all that crazy stuff who was up on the hill. Jesus does not care about the fear and the discomfort that people feel about this guy and whatever is going on with him. Jesus breaks through the taboo and he doesn't paint over the gray cloud with pretty colors. He goes to this man because he loves him. That kind of love that breaks through the fear in the taboo is the kind of love that guides us to seek therapy and admit when things are not okay. And that kind of love for us is the deep and abiding presence that just is. Matt Gaventa writes, and I'm gonna quote him here. Love is not, as the poet would say of hope, the thing with feathers. Love is the thing with armor. It is the thing with reinforced steel. Love is the thing invincible to all the chemical imbalances of creation, like those mythical post-apocalyptic cockroaches. Love survives everything. 
He goes on, when the world tears us apart, love stays together. When the brain chemistry runs us down, love stays on its feet. And someday, when all those thousand dark nights converge into the sunrise, on that day, love will still be standing. He finishes. Beloved of God, that is the kind of love that met that man from Gerasene that ancient day in the person of Jesus. God who created us out of the dust of the earth. God who has loved us since before time. God who has animated this world to evolve and heal, loves you. It's not fix it love or a love that will prevent dark nights of the soul, but it is an abiding love that is real and true. Even if you are half unraveled and you have a legion of voices in your head that's listening to me and says, yeah, whatever, God loves me, whatever, that's nice. Even if the words are flat and meaningless to you right now, it is still true. God loves you. God has loved us since before the beginning of time and always will. Amen.